In France, we're going to start with Louis the 16th furniture, the sort of thing that you want to lose your head over. It's so good. And what we see is delicate ornamentation, which will soften the severity of the straight lines and symmetrical Louis the 16th furniture. So what we're going to be looking at is a few different ideas. For example, they will use ornamentation, but they're using it to break up solid areas. It's going to be far less ostentatious than anything that we saw from the Baroque or the Rococo. So it's understated and it's intentionally so. Of course, if I left these columns quite smooth, it's a very clean look, but it's not quite the aesthetic they were looking for. We will also see the use of Ormolu and Japaning frequently in the same piece. Now, the Japaning is basically what we've seen in the past, this use of a black or very dark lacquer and then some kind of oriental scene depicted on it. But the overlay that we see, that metal overlay, is going to take on different characteristics than it had in the Rococo. It tends to be smaller, it tends to be finer, far more detailed than what we would see earlier. We're also going to see an increased use of marquetry, where they're basically, this isn't quite intarsia, this is a veneer overlay rather than an inlay. So it's a less expensive technique, but still one that's going to be commonly used to really beautify a surface. Sometimes in the form of a pattern, as we see here, sometimes in the form of a larger image. But it's going to be quite common. The use of intarsia and those sorts of forms, while they still exist, are only on the highest end. We're talking royal family kind of pieces. We're also going to see Harlequin furniture. Now, Harlequin furniture is not furniture with a sort of bright finish, but this is furniture that tends to be mechanical, tends to change in some way. In this case, a game table that both extends and stores all of the accoutrement required for gaming. And then this top would also extend in some way to cover the entire table. Now, this will become increasingly popular. They like the idea of hidden things. And so Harlequin Furniture really speaks to that. Now, in terms of seating, what you're going to see from Louis the 16th is furniture that is more subdued than what we saw from the Baroque and the Rococo. We're going to see partially gilt pieces. So in other words, there's gilding, but only in pieces of it. Uh, we also see the use of the jacquard loom for the textiles that are placed on it. So we see a lot more pictorial textiles used on these pieces. And we see examples here. Now, the typical Louis XVI oftentimes is going to be a round back hoop chair. Uh, so this is all one solid steam bent piece in many cases. And sometimes this will just come down straight into the legs. Other times it seems to be mounted onto the back of the chair. Now, we also have, and here I'm just sort of incorporating some terminology here, the use of manchettes. And these are partial armrests. These are the padded partial armrests that we see on so many of these chairs where not the whole thing is covered. I mean, obviously the front and back of the armrest is still solid wood, but it pads the part that you really need. And this speaks back to an earlier period when the use of textiles and upholstery was fairly expensive. By this point, it's becoming less expensive. And so these manchettes become more of a stylistic element. We also see the use of the shea. And this is basically an armless chair, most commonly with that hoop back that we see in the Louis XVI period. And this is what we would consider a dining chair today, something that they wouldn't have had. Frequently, people are still sitting on benches for a lot of their dining, or they have very fancy armchairs. But of course, that isn't really useful in the middle class, where you have children and other people using these chairs. So they drop those ideas. They make something a little bit simpler. 
Now, we've looked at some different styles, Louis the 13th, 14th, 15th, and 16th. And so to look at them and sort of start differentiating them, Louis the 13th, we tend to see a lot of turned patterns, but not a lot of hand carving. Also, we tend to see darker colors and any textile that we see is probably going to be hand woven. So you're going to see various issues with it. Uh, Louis the 14th, we tend to see that Baroque and Rococo use of curvilinear form. So here these are hand carved arms into our Rococo S curve uh, that you would expect. You see the same in the stretcher bar underneath. By the time we get to Louis the 15th, we start simplifying to some degree. Some of that carving is gone, some of that S curve, and instead it's a little bit straighter line. Although the legs have come proud of the seat itself, so they actually stand ahead of the seat instead of directly beneath it. This is because of the use of mahogany and other materials. And you'll notice that the, ar the seat back and the arms have actually fallen backwards as if there's a wind blowing on it by Louis the, uh, excuse me, Louis the 16th, usually you would have a rounded back, here's a square back, but we have the use of the jacquard loom, we see the use of lighter colors, and you'll notice that the carving is, while still intricate, much lower relief than what we've seen in the past, along with those column-like legs that we've grown to associate with the French neoclassical. In terms of storage, we're going to see the use of cabinets and other forms, in this case, one with the use of Japaning. And in their interest of clean lines, especially in the neoclassical, here we have two doors that would open and there will be drawers behind it. Now, there are some new forms. The Camo uh, Desert is basically going to take the place of a buffet. And it's a more interesting form. We typically have three drawers and then some quarter round shelves on the sides. Those would be to show off uh, some goods, but again, it's acting as a buffet. So you could lay food there. Uh, you could use it for any number of different forms. And the rounded forms that we see, remember I said everything is straight, is a mechanical curve. So here we see a simple 90 degree quarter circle used to define the outline of the structure. We have trumpet legs on this one moving down into a very narrow fine foot, very common to the period. And we see the use of the vitrine, which is basically a glass front bookshelf, usually uh, with the usually in the form of a break front. In other words, the front of this shelf is actually coming towards the viewer. Now, this could be used for any number of things. With the glass front, not necessarily with glass shelves, but with the glass front, it would display books, it would display chinaware, it would display oddities, all things that were quite common at the time. Now, miscellaneous pieces, of course, the guillotine is a fantastic decorative piece of the period, but Louis the 16th probably didn't think so. Uh, but we do see the use of the Athenian. Athenian. Uh, anyway, this is a wash basin. And it's not so much the piece that's in it. Oftentimes it's stone or ceramic that's been laid in because they feel that that's the classical form. But we have usually a tripod setup with three legs, often decorated with animal, mythological, or other forms. Here's our swan form on this one. Uh, here we have uh, satyrs. Here we see sheep or goats. And it's a primarily decorative piece. Now, this is a wash basin. This is the sort of thing that was brought in the morning so you could wash your face, etc. Obviously, if you're in the middle class, you're not going to afford something quite this ornate. Again, we're seeing that break between what is being used by the upper classes and what's being used by the middle class. The middle class at this point would use a pitcher and bowl setup, uh, very common in almost any antique mall today. We will also see the jardinier, which is basically a planter. What we would see is an exterior that is stone or some form of ceramic, commonly painted terracotta. And on the inside, we would have a letter tin insert. This would allow one to plant things in it and water them without the water getting all over the place since obviously terracotta, etc., is used because it's porous. 
So it was basically a planter, a heavyweight planter that would be used. This is a small example that could be used inside the home, but of course we see these outdoors as well. 